Welcome to the David Ramsey Map Center. Uh, my name is Salim Mohammed. I'm head and curator of the center. Uh, thank you for coming to the very last talk of this academic year uh, by Thomas Laird uh, on the morals of Tibet. Uh, an extended introduction is up next. It's, it's going to come up. So um, I wanted to take this opportunity to, to say that this event is uh, co-sponsored by the Department of Religious Studies and the host center for Buddhist uh, studies at Stanford. A uh, warm welcome uh, uh, from uh, warm welcome to you from from those departments, and of course uh, Tashin Publishing. Um, and before um, I introduce David Ramsey, I, I just want to quickly mention that there are two copies of the book. Uh, the the copy over here, uh, which of course Tom's going to talk extensively about, uh, is. Uh, uh, belongs to the Bowles Library, the art library on, on campus, and we have we own a copy. There's a second copy over there, uh, which uh, Jesse is going to handle way in the back, and so there will be an opportunity uh, after the talk and Q&A uh, to look at the books, and uh, if you want more information uh, about, about the book, um, Jesse's the person uh, way in the back there to, uh, to connect with. So, so without further ado, uh, David Ramsey. I think many of you know Thomas. Um, as I was researching it's his life, it's quite a, quite a journey that uh, he has been on. Um, it's a little unusual for us to be showing murals here, but they're not strictly maps, but as I've said to Thomas, they're definitely maps of a spiritual journey. So. They're right at home here. Uh, Thomas is an American journalist, writer, photographer uh, who specializes, of course, in Tibet. He divides his time between New Orleans and Kathmandu, where he lived uh, for 30 years in Kathmandu. Uh, he's photographed and written for Time and Newsweek, and since the age of 18, he's traveled widely in Tibet, Nepal, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. In 1973, while staying with Tibetan refugees in Nepal, he produced ethnographic sound recordings, which I remember from 1973, of Buddhist monasteries in Kathmandu. Uh, the resulting record was really one of the very first LPs of Tibetan ritual music ever made. He's done several books. He collaborated with Peter Matheson in 1995 uh, to publish East of the Lo Mang Thang in the land of Mustang. He was also the first Westerner to walk legally through the Himalayas uh, of Western Nepal to Mount Kailash, which you can see in the stairwell when you leave here on that Buddhist conceptual map by Hotan. It's the one with the four rivers going out of the center, a very holy spot in Buddhism. And he was the first Westerner to descend any part of Tibet's Sangpo River in a coracle, which is a small boat in modern times. Uh, for Time and Newsweek, more seriously, he wrote the first accurate report of Nepal's 2001 royal massacre and reported from the battlefields of Nepal's Maoist, Maoist revolution in 2003. His first nonfiction book, Into Tibet, the CIA's first atomic spy in his secret expedition to Lhasa was the result of 10 years of research uh, regarding the life, work, and death of Douglas McKiernan, which many of you will remember, the first CIA intelligence officer ever killed in the line of duty. His second nonfiction book was entitled The Story of Tibet, Conversations with the Dalai Lama, drawn on over 60 hours of intimate conversations with the 14th Dalai Lama, who he first met in 1993. He's also worked on two film projects, uh, Bar Barakawa, 1990, and The Gurkhas, 1998, in various roles, and was also Oliver Stone's guide in Tibet in 1996. Since 2008, he's worked to create the world's first life-size images of enormous Tibetan wall mur murals. Fine art prints of these works have been the focus of several exhibitions and are held in both private and public collections. Uh, Tashin, as you've seen today, has published Murals of Tibet in 2018. And these images will be the subject of Laird's talk today. So 
let's give him a hearty welcome and we're also going to begin with a video and then he will launch into his talk. For centuries, Tibet has been seen as an island in the sky, a remote land close to the light beyond the mountains, a mysterious land where monks practiced rituals and yoga that led to wisdom and power. in our age of increased accessibility, a great treasure still remained, hidden all of these centuries. Visions from another world, visions created to inspire, as Tibetans say, liberation upon sea. Over the course of five expeditions, and using multi-image capture and render technology, Thomas Laird amassed the first catalogue of life-size images of more than 200 Buddhist mural masterpieces, including the oldest and most important painted during the past 1,000 years. Upon seeing Laird's unique new images of the murals of Tibet, Benedict Taschen ambitiously decided to publish one of the largest and most luxurious books ever printed to display the staggering beauty and amazing detail contained within these gigantic, fragile works of art. His Holiness the Dalai Lama gave his blessing to indicate the importance of the book by signing 998 copies as part of an effort to bring the murals of Tibet to the world. Each copy signed by the Dalai Lama helps to secure the long-term preservation of this unique cultural treasure. It will be a significant moment for Tibetan and world culture. This chapter of humanity's art history won't be hidden any longer. Tashin's sumo-sized book will be a landmark in publishing for generations to come. There we go. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, Today, I'm going to have the privilege of talking to you for an hour <laughs> about the murals of Tibet. Um, we will uh, talk a bit about the book, but mostly we're going to be talking about the narratives in the murals. And I want to begin by introducing you to how the Tibetans view their land. The poem you're seeing there is ninth century. Uh, without equal, without peer, this center of the earth, the headland of all rivers, this heart of the world, fenced round by snow, where the mountains are high, and the land is pure. The purity of this landscape is central to many aspects of the life of Tibetan civilization. Uh, Tibetans feel that the first emperor, when he came to this world, he came as, as lord, but he chose it for its qualities of wise men, of pure land, of fertile land, uh, and for being hidden there's a, a deep mythology in Tibet of the hidden land, and you're going to encounter several of them today. That's not just an invention of the West. Uh, Tibetans, uh, Shangri-La, uh, I think is most well known. But uh, the, the idea of a hidden land beyond the mountains is, is part of Tibet's own definition of itself. Uh, the purity means uh, that from since ancient times, there were certain animals that should not be killed. There was certain land that should not be cut. There were certain peaks that should not be climbed. These were the provenance 
of protectors of the earth. And if you went there, not only did you have the chance of bringing their wrath on you, but you might perhaps bring it onto your entire community. So for that reason, of course, the climbing of sacred peaks was absolutely forbidden. Uh, the many aspects in the Tibetan landscape have to do with purity um, and how you treat uh, every, even the smallest creature in the land. Uh, and of course, w by the time Buddhism came, this melded very well with many basic Buddhist teachings. Uh, one of the most famous symbols of Buddhism is the turning of the wheel of the Dharma the Dharma wheel by the Buddha. The eight-spoked wheel is the eightfold path of the Buddha. And it was such a powerful presentation that even the deers listened quietly to the Buddha when he gave that pres first presentation at Deer Park in Nalanda. And so you find that symbol on the roof of many Tibetan, uh, many Tibetan temples, the deer facing the turning wheel. Within these temples, there is also purity. Purity is a, a very big deal in Tibet. The pure land, the pure mind, the pure teachings, the pure lineage. And Tibet, as a source of this preserved lineage, is very, very important to Tibetans. Of course, statues are part of that lineage. And when you go into a monastery, that's the first thing you're going to see. We're not going to talk about those today. <laughs> We're going to talk about the murals of Tibet. Uh, the murals of Tibet. Um, of course, I, I think are very important. <laughs> and His Holiness ultimately agreed with me and agreed to sign all 1,000 copies of this book because of the work, not because of me, uh, but because of the nature of the work, the importance of the murals. And I, I said earlier, some of you have heard, when I asked him to sign all 1,000 copies, he said, why? Why should I sign 1,000 sheets of paper? And I said, y Your Holiness, Humans are greedy. And 300 years from now, when a copy of this book is, survives in a library somewhere and there's a fire, which book will they save first? They're going to save the expensive one. <laughs> so we're using human greed to help protect this transmission. So you can see I'm working within the, the narrative from, from a long time, including my relations with him. So. One of the reasons I, I became so entranced with the murals of Tibet was because of the way Tibetans treat them. They approach murals with incredible reverence, as though it was the Buddha himself. Um, they treat the images with incredible reverence, as though they were the Buddha themselves. And every layer of this image that you're seeing, the skulls around the door, that tells us that that's a gongkong. Inside, you're entering into a protector's world, where you might want to cover your mouth to prevent your dirty breath from offending the gods inside. The, the, the offerings that people have made in front of the mural. This is the Tibetan world. This is how they are used. It's an act of reverence. It's an act of transmission. These are worshipped by people. These are storytelling. And in most cases, they're invisible. Um, it, so that when you go to Tibet, you don't see most of the images I'm going to be showing you today. You can see them if you go up with a flashlight or a candle. You can see some small part of it. And you can assemble that image in your own brain. But you can't actually see it flat. One of the other reasons, of course, that I decided to work on this was because they're disappearing. Um, a thousand years of Tibetan heritage has, is disappearing, and um, half was lost in the 20th century. Um, and so what survives is even more precious. I have to say, it was the destruction of Bamiyan that really made me put down my 0% credit cards and begin this project. Uh, when my wife and I saw Bamiyan being destroyed, and I had tried to raise money to go to Bamiyan and photograph the murals, because the Taliban had told us what they were going to do. And there was no money forthcoming. 
uh, from foundations. And so after Bamyang came down, my wife and I just looked at one another and said, it's our responsibility. And we took it on. So I want to talk to you today about the diversity of narratives. That book contains 120 different murals, images from 120 different murals. And there's an incredible diversity. I just want to very quickly, here at the beginning, run through the diversity of narratives for you. Of course, there's the Buddha. This is a Pala period Buddha, which is around 10th, 11th century from India. This is the life of the Buddha in a previous life as a dance master, so Jataka tales. This is a map of the universe. We'll talk more about it later. This is the very famous Wheel of Life, showing how we're born and reborn and die and how the basic emotions drive us as we go round and round. This is the creation of the Tibetan race by Chen Risi. This is the Bodhisattva Chen Risi in the 100,000 formed, 100,000 armed version. This is a protector deity, Vajrayaksa. This is a very rare uh, an important mural from the Dalai Lama's private yoga and meditation chapel showing conscious rebirth and the development of an embryo. This is Opame and his Western paradise. So this is a world that is not real. Uh, it's a map of a world and how we, and, and, uh, that you would go to after you die. This is a real map. Uh, this is painted probably around 17, 20, 1750. We will revisit this map several times. Um, this is a map of a land that doesn't exist called Shambhala, um, where many secret Buddhist teachings were hidden. This is part of an illustration of a Tibetan libretto. This is death. This is yoga, various yoga postures. This is Havadra, uh, one of the most important Mother Tantra teachings. And that is life size. That's ten, it's a, a little less than life size, 10 by 10 feet, painted 1427 by a named Tibetan artist. This is a hero, Guru Rinpoche, who has achieved near liberated state and is using his powers for the good of all mankind. And this is politics. This is Kublai Khan with uh, Pagpa. Uh, who becomes the imperial preceptor. So you see, we have had everything here from embryonic development to cause the beginning of the cosmos to maps. Uh, to it's, it's a world view. It is a complete world view hidden within the murals of Tibet. And most of the time, you cannot see them. And so when I took on this task, I was really driven by that. I mean, that's what made me invest and, and spend a decade of my life doing this was the fact that it could be lost. The other basic issue I want to address at the beginning is the evolution of style. You see here this Buddha from Dratang painted in 1080, this Buddha from Kumbum painted in 1427, and that Buddha in the Jokong from 1989. You see how things change over a 1,000 years. Things change. Things stay the same. The ears, the long ears, are there in all three. The half-closed eyes are all there. The mudra is the same. The unishka, and I will be mispronouncing many words, so don't call me on it. Um, the unishka uh, at the top of the head, which is a symbol of the physiological transformation of the human body that allows spiritual achievement. Uh, because Tibetans have a belief about physiology that's quite different than ours. Um, so you see these changes. And, and I could go to this and say, you know, Siddhartha, the young prince, he had so much gold in his ears that it stretched his ears when he was a young man. right? And that's what gave him those long ears. Uh, and you could talk to a Chinese student of Buddhism, and they would say to you, when you become enlightened, your ears will grow. Mm -hmm. the, the fact is, people attach different metaphors to these over time. But it doesn't change. It remains a central aspect of Buddhism, the transmission of this. So this Buddha on the left, we're seeing him again now, from 1080, is an Indian, uh, very much an Indian-influenced Buddha. 
And you can see that in the lips and in the eyes. And this is Neuar. And that is Chinese from 1412. And this is Tibetan in 1450. And here you see the Unishka has adopted the Chinese Unishka, this particular painter. So you can see there's been an evolution of Tibetan painting stylistically from Indian and Nepali and Chinese influences over a 1,000 years. It changed. However, when we talk about the, or the uh, beginning of style of Tibet, we have to go to Greece. And this is not something that most people realize. <laughs> if you look at this Chinese painting from 1412 and the statue of the Buddha from the first century, you can see it's shocking when you put them together. You see his robe sticking out underneath? You see the neckline? You see the folds? It's identical. It's a copy. The Chinese are copying an original model of the Buddha created in the Indo-Greek city-states of northwest India in the first century after Christ. Now, to refresh your memory, Alexander invaded India in the fourth century. But that colonial pulse from Greece did not end then. There was a whole series of city-states for 400 years with pure Greek bloodlines using the Greek language. And the very first image of the Buddha is on a gold coin of Kanishka I. From the time of the death of the Buddha around whatever, we'll argue about it, but four or five, six hundred BC, until the time of Christ, there were no images of the Buddha. There are footprints, there are leaves, there are various symbols of the Buddha, but there are no images of the Buddha. Until suddenly, in the Greek, Indo-Greek city-states in the first century, the first images of the Buddha emerge. They're being created within Greek ateliers. And, and, and the, the robes that you're seeing, the robes that you're seeing here, um, this is said to be an exact copy from Marcus Aurelius. So when we think about the transmission of, of stylistic impulse into Asia and the beginning of all Buddhist art in the world, if we want to begin, we begin in Greece. And it wasn't a one-way transmission. Where the hell do you think the Stoic philosophers in Rome got those ideas? They got them from the Buddha. It's much easier to prove this. It's very hard to prove the, the, the arrival of Buddhist thinking into Europe by the time of the Stoics. But it, I think when you see this, you begin to realize that globalization is not a new thing. Uh, this has been going on for thousands of years. And the first thing that gets transmitted is ideas and images. So I just wanted to introduce that to you. Uh, and I'll give you two more quick examples. The birth of the Buddha. You see the Buddha here coming out of the side of the mother? It, the Buddha did not have a vaginal birth. We think it was a C-section. Um, and at any rate, all images of this in Tibet and elsewhere show this. But this image that the Tibetans are preserving, you see her holding onto the sal tree. You see her attendant lady here. You see the deity receiving the Buddha beside. That's 100 AD. It's a Greek statue. That's where this began. I mean, I, I think I've made my point. Uh, we think of this as Asian art, but the staging, the, crap, the staging of these images and this iconography begins in the Indo-Greek city-states and has been very accurately transmitted for a 1,000 years since then. One more final example, because I love this subject so much. You see the monk down here? You see the back of his head? You see the monk up there crying? The Buddha is dying. And different people are having different responses to the death of the Buddha. One guy's crying. Another guy is sitting, doing his practice and following his breath, like he's supposed to be doing, like any good Stoic would do, like any good Buddhist would do. It's identical. There's no change. And, and somehow, when we put Buddhist art into the oriental box, it's worth less. When we understand that this is our art, 
suddenly you look at the murals of Tibet a little differently. This is not some oriental thing in a glass box. This is part of world heritage, and it, 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 it's, I, I'm, as you can see, I'm very passionate about the subject. Um, one of the first purposes of the murals of Tibet is didactic. And by that I mean when the Buddha was alive, we know that he designed one painting, one sketch. He was explaining to some monks one day, you know, there's a heaven and there's a hell, and there's a human realm, and then there's an animal realm, and then there's a hell realm, and then there's a realm for predators. And you are driven by ignorance, represented by the pig. And I ha again, I could have this wrong. I'm speaking without notes. Um, uh, he, the bird is, uh, the, and, and the bird and the snake represent attachment and aversion. And these three poisons drive you round and round. And the purpose of the Buddhist path is to teach you how to get off of the wheel of life, how to achieve enlightenment. So up there in the heaven realm, you see the titans and the gods are fighting with greed, anger, ignorance, over the, tree, the fruit of the tree of immortality. So even the gods, just like the Greek gods, are being driven by greed, anger, ignorance, lust, and pride. They're not divine beings. They are on the wheel with us. They are divine and, well, we won't go there, but you see what I'm saying. They have the same motivations. In the human world, you see humans living a good life, as the Tibetans saw it. You see them giving uh, alms to the poor, the husband and wife together, the, the Indian yogis coming from afar, receiving alms down at the bottom. And, th so, and then we go to the animal realm, and you see humans mistreating the animals for greed, the killing them. This is the wheel that we are trapped on. And one of the places you go because of your actions is hell. Another place you go is heaven. And you go round and round. Hell is not eternal. Heaven is not eternal. You burn up your karma. So this is a didactic. The story I just told you has been told for a thousand years using this painting. This painting is at the front of all Tibetan monasteries. It's there for the very reason that I just gave you, the stories I just told you. This is a didactic. This is one of the main purposes of Tibetan murals. Um, there is another didactic that's commonly seen at, at the front of most major temples, including the Patala. You see, the, we're, going, we're gonna go inside the eastern gate over here. Um, this image you're looking at is uh, you're looking at life-size image of the image. So this is a 14 gigabyte uh, multi-image capture and render image. I don't just make gigapixel images of the murals. We make gigapixel captures of the landscapes as well, of course. So that allows us to do this on the same image. Uh, and now we're going into that gate. And in that gate, uh, we're seeing Virupaksha, the king of the West. This is one of, you're about to meet the kings of the four directions. Uh, they're part of the cosmology of the Tibetan universe. Uh, and so here again, we have a didactic about one of the four kings of the four directions. Uh, they are guardians of the world. These are people to whom you make offerings in temples, and then they bring you long life. They bring you children. They bring you different things in life. And when the Dalai Lama walked up to me a year ago when I gave him the first copy of this book, it happened to be open to this. This is the only mural in the Potala that I was able to capture. And, he walked, and I, I had no great expectations for this mural. Uh, however, when he walked up to this and he said, ah, demons, I can't believe anymore. And I said, what do you mean, your holiness? And he said, you know, the average people go to a temple and they make offerings. This demon doesn't exist except here. The demon is greed, anger, ignorance, lust, and pride. The offering that we make in the temple of our heart is to transform them into wisdom and charity and compassion. Boom, emptiness teaching, 15 seconds. That's what these murals can do. A mural that is created for an ancient Indian mythology is suddenly in the hands of a Buddhist master, you know, for you, for me, alone, in 15 seconds, it was a basic teaching on emptiness. If I hadn't prepared myself by years of work, 
I might not have gotten that teaching. But th it's not to demean the people who go to temples and make offerings. You have the levels of faith and belief and knowledge in these murals. And you also have the level of becoming. So these didactics are not just simple things for peasants. You, the, the, your emptiness perception will be increased by the more you have had faith when you abandon it, when you cut through knowledge and leap into becoming. The power of that journey is fueled by your faith and your knowledge. The murals are transmitting all of this through a lifetime. You walk past this every day from the time you're three. And then when you're 60, the Dalai Lama gives you the emptiness teaching. It's a powerful thing. Don't dismiss these murals as just didactics. There's far more going on here. We're going to take a journey to Samye, the first monastery in Tibet. I'm just trying to keep an eye on the time. <laughs> yeah, we're going to take a quick journey to uh, Samye. And here in Samye, you have a beautiful map. <laughs> David. <laughs> and uh, this has actually the heights of the buildings noted. Uh, it has many details about the construction. And this is the first monastery in Tibet. And we're going to hear some stories about how it was created. So the great hero, Guru Rinpoche, was summoned by the first emperor, Trisun Detson, uh, to Tibet after Santi Rakshita, the monk, had failed to found the monastery. Why was Santi Rakshita having so much trouble? He was having so much trouble because, and this is the place. Did you see the Chortons in the top of that painting? Those Chortons up there mark the spot where Guru Rinpoche met Trisun Detson. Um, and they're still there. Um, so when Guru Rinpoche arrived, he sat with the king and, and Santi Rakshita, and they did these various rituals. And they appeased the, 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 the spirits of the earth. Do you remember that was the very first thing we talked about, was the purity of the earth. These are protectors of the earth. And these people were causing floods. These Nagas were causing floods and hail. And they were having battles. And Guru Rinpoche came, and he defeated them all in battle. And the Nagas bowed to him. And he converted all the lords of the earth to protectors of Buddhism. And that is the foundational myth of Buddhism in Tibet is about landscape. Uh, it's about the foundation of the first temple. And Santi Rakshita behind uh, Guru Rinpoche. Guru Rinpoche there is being escorted by his consort, Yeshi Droma, who is, I don't know, but what they tell me, the wife of Trisun Detson. So we had an open relationship here. And, 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 and Yeshi Droma is considered a female Buddha. And, and the, the, the emperor was happy for his wife to receive the tantric teachings from Guru Rinpoche. Uh, I'm just telling you, tantric Buddhism is, is, is much more than we think. Uh, there's levels of teachings here that far exceed what we, we know in general. This is the location where that mural lives. Over there on the right, the whole story I've been telling you is there. Here on the left, we have a completely different story. The seventh Dalai Lama. This is about 12 by 30 feet captured at 200% life size. Um, and because of that, we can zoom in and take a quick look at uh, the seventh Dalai Lama, and we can actually translate the inscription beneath him, uh, the Supreme Lord, the physical presence of the compassion of all the Buddhas, holder of the lotus, enjoying here and now the playful dance of the saffron robe. So that's a bit of humor. The, 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 the monk who is the Dalai Lama, the manifestation of Chen Risi, it's it, 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 the play of the saffron robe. It's not being taken very seriously. Uh, there's always a, an element of humor. And uh, it, it, it's a very Tibetan aspect of, of, of these inscriptions. Um, on to the right of the Dalai Lama's throne, you see the dragon. He is the central pillar at the center of the universe. The, 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 uh, the uh, court is arrayed around him. So here you have the laymen making offerings. Here you have the, uh, the nobles, his, his, uh, 
his secretaries writing letters beneath his throne, foreigners coming from abroad, the Dalai Lama is above him. He is the central mountain in the center of the Tibetan universe. Uh, this is a social order, and it's reflecting Tibetan ideas about geographic order, and of course the dragon is controlled by him. Now we're down in the far right corner and we're looking at a lady from Amdo who's staring out of the painting directly into your eyes and with her husband. And then you have these Mughals have come from India, some bearing, uh, what do you call it, tusks from elephants and some bearing silk brocade. Uh, this is a very typical sort of narrative that you would see uh, in Tibet uh, of, a, of a court scene. The noble has a censor, and that is from the Metropolitan Museum, um, showing you the exact same object. And the monks beneath are writing a letter. And they are reading a letter to one another. And because of the details that are there, we're able to translate the letter. And because of that, we're able to date the letter. This is a letter from the Manchu emperor to the Dalai Lama on a specific date with a specific text. There's a great thing about gigapixel imagery. You, I don't have to know anything about the murals when I'm capturing them. I capture everything. And then I give it to scholars, and they can decode it. And this is, it's very different than taking a photograph. Every image you're looking at, it, I, I, it's for all from one image. It's from one gigapixel file, 50 gigabyte. Uh, so th th it's a, these are not photographs, and it allows us whole new levels of understanding. We've been here on the second floor, and now we're going to the Western Chapel. You can make it out over there as well. The whole temple is, a ra is created like a mandala. Um, and inside the Western Chapel, you see another map of uh, Samye, and then you see a map of the universe. Um, this map of the universe has a central pillar with different gems on all four sides. The kings of the four directions live on the lower slopes. Indra lives in the top palace, and arrayed around it are different universes or solar systems. It's not possible to completely correlate this with our cosmological ideas. But this is Jambudvipa, and that's where we live, down there on that spade. And uh, the, this, the Abhidharma Kosha does talk about expansion and contraction and great time. Um, but more than that, many of these, this is another view of the Abhidharma, Abhidharma Kosha, again showing those little strange little worlds circling the, 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 the center. That's from Bhutan, actually. And now we've come in a little bit, and we can see the moon over here and the sun circling the central pillar. And then up in the top, you see Indra. As you see, the temple at Samye looks very much like, suspiciously like, the palace of the gods. And this is the moon being pulled by the chariots around the central pillar. And that's the sun. And this is Jambudvipa, where we live. Uh, whether this is a planet, a solar system, a universe, uh, a bubble, a single bubble in a multiverse, we don't know. Uh, but it's funny to think that in the Abhidhamma Kosha, going back, the Mahayana priest probably in the, I don't know, 12th, 11th, 13th, 14th century, um, he was talking about expansion and contraction and billions of years. Uh, so that's about all that we can say about this. And the Dalai Lama, by the way, in passing, completely rejects this cosmology and accepts the Big Bang. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so we've gone back to the Patala. The Patala was built by the fifth Dalai Lama and his Mongol patron uh, assisted with that a great deal. But the fifth Dalai Lama died before it could be completed. And, uh, and his regent had to finish the work. You see the little temple behind the Potala. That's called the Lukang. Uh, this is in a map from around 1720 uh, that the 14th Dalai Lama lived with for the first year of his life. This was at the foot of his bed uh, in his bedroom. Um, and so the Patala uh, was built, they needed a lot of mud. They used mud as mortar. And so when they were um, extracting that mud, they angered the Nagas. Do you remember? We're coming back to the Nagas. Um, they, they angered the earth gods, and uh, they appeared to the Dalai Lama, and they said, 
this, pl this hole you've dug is an offense, and we're going to be angry with you. And he said, I'll, I'll appease you. I'll make you an offering of a temple. And people will come to your temple every day. He died, and his regent carried out that work. Um, and so the temple was built in the pond behind the Patala. And um, oops. And uh, it has three stories. And we're going to talk as briefly as possible about the images there. The, bo the most basic transmission here is from Pema Lingpa, uh, the Dzogchen master who discovered the text of the tantric cycles. We, I mean, this is a whole subject in itself, so we're not going into it. But Pema Lingpa got, uh, he said to the people, look, there's a treasure hidden in the pond. Um, you see my candle? My candle will not go out when I enter the, enter the pond. He goes under water and comes out with his candle still burning. And he has the box with the treasure of this hidden text. And so this, uh, the Terma, exactly. Um, the Terma finder, Pimalingpa. And on, on the same mural, we have the fifth Dalai Lama, the sixth Dalai Lama, and his father. So this is a lineage mural inside the Lukang, which gives you a great deal of information, not only about the origin of the paintings there and the teachings behind them, but also about the aspirations the 14th Dalai Lama gave me a personal transmission about the purpose. You, you may know the 6th Dalai Lama was not married. He refused to become celibate. And the, the, Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama believes that Chen Risi, Ablukiteshvara, had instructed him not to become married so that he could create a father to son transmission of royalty because the, the reincarnate lineage was causing a lot of political trouble. So the sixth Dalai Lama attempted to end the reincarnation of a new king. And using the, the, the methodologies and the teachings he needed for that would be practices of a non-celibate nature. And so the, the teachings of the Lukang are incredibly important. They are from a very specific political moment with a very specific spiritual teaching very different from many teachings in Tibet. When you enter the temple, what you see on the ground floor is the Naga, and you make an offering to the Naga, and the Naga will bring wealth and health to your family. Uh, but when you go to the second floor, you see, and at first it's not very clear, there's a Naga. There's a story about a Naga, but it's this huge narrative. And it took me years to understand. You saw that little Naga down here? <laughs> it took me years to understand what was going on here. In fact, this is the libretto of a Tibetan opera. And this is a previous life of Guru Rinpoche. Um, and so th this, if you were to see this performance, it would take three days as an opera. And here, we're just going to very quickly say that the king was very bad. He beat people. And uh, then we're going to say that he summoned uh, Pema Ombar's father. And we always know who Pema Ombar is because he is always gold. These are cartoon panels. There's no line between the cartoon panels. But we're looking at a cartoon. And so Pema Lingpa's father was forced to go to sea in this ship. And unfortunately, he did not have the mantra from the Naga. And so he died in a sea wreck. And then, go, and then the bad king, you see how sly he is, he then said to Pema Umbar, well, your father failed to do it, so you have to go back and finish his job. And so Pema Umbar went to sea. But his mother had obtained for him secretly the mantra for the Naga. And so the Naga then gave him the wish-fulfilling jewel. And this is a jewel that if you hold it, anything you wish for, you may have. The Buddha Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha Dharma are called the wish-fulfilling jewel. So this is not just a story about physical treasure. This is a story about spiritual treasure. And so he got the treasures. They went to the land. They got all the gold. They got the blessings of the Nagas. They went back home. And everybody lived happily ever after with the Dharma teachings and lots of gold. That's a very brief summary of a 72 chapter of a three-day <laughs> opera. Uh, um, there's another narrative in this building. So we've had one narrative. That's the second floor. Now we're on the ground floor. This is the Kali Chakra Tantra. Uh, this is one of the most important teachings in Tibet. The Dalai Lama has given it several times in exile. Uh, and gave it once, in, uh, once or twice in Tibet beforehand. You see here the, the, the Kali Chakra Mandala, the Buddha Shakyamuni, 
visiting with the first king of Shambhala. Down here, you see that same mural in situ over here, hiding, right? And then you see the other kings, that his sons that would come after him. And then you see the once and future king. So this is all one mural cycle. This is the most complete presentation of the Kali Chakra Tantra in Tibet. It begins with Kala Chakra Pada going to Shambhala in the 13th or 14th century and finding the teachings preserved by the Shambhala kings and managing to escape with those teachings and coming back to India and giving it into the West. This is a painting of Shambhala uh, as it shaped as a mandala surrounded by mountains in the, uh, the, Dali, the 13th Dalai Lama's private meditation chamber in the Norbulinka. Um, so this is the Kali Chakra mandala, the main, the main uh, teaching. Uh, and so the Buddha went to Shambhala. He gave the teachings of the Kali Chakra and created a, an actual mandala on this pavilion in the gardens of Shambhala. You know that Shangri-La is based on the Shambhala myth. I mean, that's where this comes from. And, yeah. and so uh, the Kali Chakra Tantra is focused on this mandala, which is usually made as a um, sand mandala for the teachings. And this is a visualization practice. Uh, we're now here you know, 10 times life size. Uh, we're able to zoom in in incredible detail uh, because of the gigapixel images. Um, and so this is actually a visualization that you should construct in your own mind when you are doing this practice. Um, this was given to the first king of Shambhala. He preserved it. And the Buddha then left and went back and completed his life in our world. And we are now awaiting the arrival of Rudra Chakra, Rudra Cochran who will be the last and future king of Shambhala. It is said that he will emerge from Shambhala in his flying machines at a time when the West and the Muslims are at war with one another. And he will come to our world and defeat all military powers and initiate a 1,000 years of peace, which is, of course, very similar to the, uh, the Sunni uh, ideas about the, th the coming you know, the, the coming teacher with the, in the Muslim era and the Christian and the Muslim. I mean, that, so we have Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, all talking about a thousand years of peace. Uh, I, I, and, and the reason this probably exists, if we look for, if as a historian, we assume that this was written in the 12th or 13th century, then we know exactly why it was written like this, because the Muslims were invading India and destroying Buddhism at that time. And so this Tantra emerged at a time and was transmitted to Tibet at a time when Muslims were destroying Buddhism. So there's a reason why the Muslims are kind of portrayed as the bad guys here. Uh, it's because of historical and political reasons. Um, Rudra Cochran, these are some of his generals in his battle to save the universe. This is the type of uh, um, chain mail that, and, and, and armoring that he would have worn. And now we come to the great centerpiece of the, of the uh, Lukang on the top floor. And the images that you see there are the north wall. And you've seen the double page spread in the book. There they are. This is a photograph. Yes, it's a 360 degree spherical photograph of the room. But that's what you see. You can't really see the murals. And so you be, with this, you really begin to understand that I don't take pictures of murals. I make images of the visions within them. This is accurate to what's there, but when you go there, you can't see it. It's invisible. It requires immense amount of work to get in here and, and shoot hundreds of frames. These do slide back and forth. But it's still, it's an immense amount of work to extract this. At the end of the day, my job is to make you think that you're looking at a perfect picture of the mural. That's a delusion. Um, I, I, we're going to just briefly try to briefly go through this. The beginning of the world. <laughs> you remember this map? It's the same one from the Abhidharma Kosha. We've seen this already, right? Note the, at the top, the Baga on the hill top. You will, we'll get to her in a minute. Uh, and then over here, the birth of a single individual and their development as an embryo 
in the uterus, birth, death. The transmission between life, the Bardo Todal, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and then the seven yogas of Naropa and all the top secret, undocumented, oral transmission only visualization practices, right? So up there, you notice, you see the letters beside everybody? Uh, and then over here, there's none. Over here, you have murals. We're, we're now at uh, two or 300 percent life size. Um, and we're look again, I want you to look up to the Baga at the top by the two kinds of forest, the dying forest and the spring forest. The one, two, three, four, five, six glowing chakras up there, not five. Um, but down here, everywhere else, you have five. It's always five. Uh, and then this is the chapter header. This is a visual chapter header. These are the two creatures, and I'm not going to give you their names, who are having a dialogue. Right? So these are having a dialogue. And these are chapter headers. Everywhere here you're seeing chapter headers of a text so that when you're studying this, you can follow along in the book. That's the beginning of the universe. This is the beginning of a single human being and their death. And that's their death and reincarnation. So we're going to go quickly in here and talk about the Bhaga. Uh, the text does not use the word vagina or female genitalia in any description. He uses the word Bhaga. Um, and the text says prior to the existence of the five elements, even the name of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas didn't exist. From space arose wind, from wind, water, and from water, earth. <laughs> Which, came, which, which became support for sentient beings. Wind arose within the Bhaga from which manifests moisture and from that flesh, the abiding place of the mind. So this is a cosmogony. They're using female, uh, they're using in a transgressive way, female genitalia to slap you across the face because they're not using the word, but they know you will. So female genitalia is being used as the birth of the universe in 1700 in a very serious context in Tibet. When is the first image used in a serious context in, West, in all of Western art appear used in a serious context? I'm just asking. It's not 1700. And look at this vagina. I mean, this is an explicit image of the vagina. When does an explicit image of the, vagina, of the vagina appear in Western art in a serious way? Not as a giggle factor, but as a serious, this is a metaphor. You know, they're, they're doing something very transgressive here and something very radical and something very powerful within this setting. I, yeah, I, and it took me years to even see this. It was only Namkai Norbu who gave me the instructions on this, finally, for me to be able to see it. One of the other things you notice down here, the universe, the kings of the four directions living on the lower slopes, Indra above. Remember uh, Jambudvipa the, is down there at the bottom, the blue one. But also notice over here the mirror and the yogi pointing at the crystal. Um, and what you see there, and that's to help you see where we are. We're down at the bottom left. And what you see here is this yogi is pointing at the crystal, and you kind of have to wonder, you know, why? Um, what, is, what is the mirror? What is the crystal? In fact, they are representations of mind. Uh, and this is a direct transmission going back to the time of Christ, or I mean, the time of Buddha or before. Uh, the Yoga Sutra of Pantanjali specifically uses crystals as a metaphor of the mind and of perception. And the Tibetans are transmitting this very clearly uh, in these paintings in the Lukong. Uh, so this is not just a painting about the world as something exterior, but something about the nature of our perceptions. Here you see the, the conscious rebirth. A yogi is achieving conscious rebirth. Here, that's normal rebirth, the origin of the single uh, uterus of a single embryo, the development of the embryo in the uterus for 39 weeks, and then the last 39 weeks, and then the uh, birth. 
and then the death of the individual swept away by the rivers, the three poisons. Um, and then we skip over the Bardo Todal and we come to the yoga. Uh, these yoga postures have the, the extensive uh, links to the text that's being used. These down here, the higher yoga teachings, uh, the Dzogchen teachings, the highest levels of Dzogchen teachings illustrated here and perhaps nowhere else. Um, they do not have any written inscriptions. You're on your own. You have to go to a teacher for, or for direct oral instructions. Um, and so we know exactly which chapters of Pema Lingpa's text we're talking about here. And one of the things they're working on is the, the, the Kundalini, the, the infamous Kundalini. He's doing a meditation on a waterfall here, the Ida and the Pengali, the lunar and solar channels, then the third channel arising in the middle. And finally, the yogi uh, is able to integrate that entirely and project his consciousness into a Buddha realm where he receives direct transmissions from a Buddha and a higher realm. This is a unique set of murals. There, you could, uh, a teacher could teach you for weeks about this one panel. Uh, I'm not going to do that. We are going to move along quickly to the Gyanse Stupa, uh, where you have 72 chapels. Uh, the lords of Gyanse lived in their palace, and they created the Gyanse Stupa, which has 72 uh, chapels on seven floors. This is where the paintings are. This is the largest collection of 15th century murals in Tibet, um, all in one building. It's a World Heritage Site. And uh, on the ground floor, you have a lot of Buddhas. Uh, this is Siddhartha Shakyamuni. You can, this is the only Buddha I ever met with eyelashes. So it's a very complete uh, visualization of the Buddha right down to the eyelashes and his teaching gesture there and his rainbow. Um, Opame, you see on the right wall, this is what you would see if you went to the temple. That's about as good as you could hope to see. And so what I make are these images, uh, flat planar images of the whole vision. And that's about life size. It's a little less than life size. And I can print this out on gessoed raw Belgian linen at exactly this size. So this gigapil gigapixel image has all the details that are in the original. And when Tibetans talk about the paintings, they talk about a uh, tongdol, a liberation through seeing. And this is what they're talking about. That compassion that you see radiating there is not about words. This is about a direct transmission on mindfulness uh, that's reaching you beyond words. He's, he's encouraging you to join him in his paradise, and you will arrive in his paradise by lotus birth. So in this world, there's no pain of delivery and birth for the mother or the child, and you spend your life listening to the teachings of Opame. This cult of Opame, the Western paradise, very popular in Tibet, China, Tibet, uh, and Japan. The Bodhisattva Chenrisi in the 100,000 armed version, again, radiating compassion, and his ability to reach any human being with a multitude of different tools uh, suitable for a whole range of different creatures. On the fourth floor, you have the mandalas. And then on the sixth and seventh floors, you have the mother and father tantras. These are the largest tantric pieces of art in the world, so far as we know. Uh, there's nothing like them in any Western museum. These are immovable. And, the, and when you go to the location, that's what you see. Uh, making this is a work of many months. Uh, the capture took a week for one of these, and then the render takes months. Uh, this is Havadra. Uh, this is one of the most esoteric. Normal pilgrims visiting this site would not go to the top floor would not have access to this tantric imagery. Um, and this is now Chakrasamvara. And this is a statement from the artist. This is the artist's statement from 1427. <laughs> and as you can see, Paldin is not shy about claiming ability. 
Um, so the idea that you know this the Tibetan uh, the art of Tibet is essentially uh, anonymous is nonsense. Uh, Tibetans were very proud. Art Tibetan artists were very proud of this work. And then we go to Gonkar Chudi for a quick taste of death. Um, death is the central realization of the Buddha. The fact that you will die and that this precious human life is, is very precious because you will die. Uh, and you know the, the crane here, sort of recapitulating, the stork here recapitulating in a horrific way a European mythology about babies being delivered, is actually carrying a half-eaten corpse of a baby. And the, 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 the Toman is bringing a corpse into the charnel ground so that to be tied up so the dogs and the storks can more easily eat it. And meanwhile, you have a Mahasiddha there sitting equanimously in meditation. It's Varupa. Um, Varupa is an amazing character, a Mahasiddha, a hero. Uh, he is not frightened of anything that you see here. It brings him no horror. Uh, and he's the model of, uh, of how we should face challenges in life ec with equanimity, neither accepting nor rejecting, but embracing all. Um, in, in the face of death, we can react in horror, or we can seize our awareness of death as fuel for the life we have to live, this very brief moment we have to live. Um, I, I, I don't want to go too far, but I can't leave without showing you this, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, this is a, a, an objectively observed painting. This is called Sky Burial. And the, the monk is helping the vulture eat the brains of the corpse from the flayed skin. So they're, they're cutting up the body to be able to feed it to the birds, and the dogs are enjoying the feast. This, this is all by one named Tibetan artist. Uh, and as you can see, his control of line, the, 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 the subject matter may horrify you, but the control of line in that yawning dog, the fact that he's observed that correctly from life, you've all seen that. You've also seen this. There's a motion in a few strokes. This is not considered. This is a hand that is freely doing this. It's a great work of art. Uh, besides being didactic and instructive, about the Buddhist vision of the universe we're living in. Uh, this is just to jump a thousand miles, uh, this and, and several centuries. This is also a charnel ground, a huge cha a charnel ground underneath uh, Chakrasamvara Mandala in Western Tibet. But you can see how similar it is. The motif is very much the same. Uh, this is a persistent belief uh, in Buddhism. And this beautiful mural of the Buddha you see him sitting in meditation, ha eyes half closed, surrounded by scenes of his, his life, this life. That's a, a story uh, of the Buddha encountering a poor um, water buffalo. You see here the Chinese influence on this artist. The artist is saying, I have seen the Chinese paintings, and I am able to do that as well. So I'm a master of all techniques. Uh, he's exhibiting his power there. In this, you see a lot of different emotions. You see the horror of this. You see the the woman, the 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 monk, the monk, the monk who should not be touching a woman, inappropriately touching a woman, and ignoring all of this. You see the the child pulling at her mother. You see the man crying in horror, uh, and you see at the center the buffalo being tortured by animals and humans, and the Buddha saying. Do you know why you are suffering? And the buffalo says, yes, Lord, I know that in a past life. This is the teaching. This is the didactic. And so you've been in these rooms. You leave. You travel a 1,000 miles. You go into another temple. At Shalu. And Shalu has some of the most amazing murals in Tibet. This is the founder from around 1080. These are the five Buddhas, the first presentation of the Buddhas. That's about half life size. 
And then above the door, you see the mandala of Varokana. And that's what we're focused on here, is this one mural. And now we're, I don't know, 20 times life size. And you start to pixelate out. Uh, I also in Shalu, this beautiful teaching Buddha. A very unique aspect to this. The Buddha is in a teaching mural, a mudra. He's underneath the Bodhi tree. But not only does he have the rainbow indicating his enlightened status around him, the tree itself, the Bodhi tree itself, has become enlightened. It's turned into all the colors of the rainbow. This is the only painting in Tibet where I ever saw an artist develop this particular motif. Very Newar, Nepali influence. The mudra. And then on the top floor, on the ground floor at Chalu, this is Rangjung Georgi, the third Karmapa. He was unhappy with the Jataka tales that were transmitted from India. There were only 33, so he created another 66 to make 100. And in this, we see that one of the Jatakas that he creates is the Buddha as a dance master. And the Buddha was very good at dancing in his previous life. And he danced for kings, and he made them happy, and everyone was very joyous. Notice the eye-to-eye -eye contact. The funny thing about this stylistically is that this is not Tibetan. This is purely Newar. This is the largest, finest, surviving Newar Kathmandu Valley painting in the world. It happens to be preserved in Tibet. Uh, it's, and, and everything about this painting is, a, is accurately observed, 13th century Kathmandu Valley. Those of you who've been there, you may recognize the copper horns, the tika marks, the symbols, many, many aspects of this. And then we go to Punsoling. An amazing location with an amazing founder uh, who thought that he was a reincarnation of an Indian and demanded to be served chapatis and dal. Uh, and he did some incredible paintings there. This is Surya, the Bodhisattva Surya. You see above him the life of the Buddha, a scene from the life of the Buddha when he's cutting off his, his hair. That's very typical for scenes of the Buddha that you should have a detail. But I just notice what a small detail that is over there as part of this composition. Taranatha was an amazing artist. Uh, and these colors, I don't know who told him that pink and green and orange and turquoise would work. But as you can see, it does. Unique, unique painting of a unique style. And finally. Uh, I'm sorry this has gone on so long, but finally we go to Dratang, where in 1080 uh, was painted a series of paintings that have now become the largest, oldest surviving paintings in Tibet. Um, because of the destruction of many others, uh, this is what's left. Uh, this is pure Pala era. And when I first went there uh, back in the 90s, I tried doing multi-image capture, but I didn't have the RAM to be able to render it. So that's the sort of image I was able to create in the 1990s. Um, but today, of course, I can create a life-size image. It's a 15 gigapixel image, 7 by 25 feet, um, giving you full access uh, to what is there, including the cobwebs on the painting and the, every detail from the, the aesthetics of the Pala era, um, which we have no Pala period paintings left in India. They were all destroyed by the Muslim invasion. The boots. Remember the boots of Kanishka I on the coin? There they are, a, th a, thousand, a thousand years later. The 13th Dalai Lama died. And the 14th Dalai Lama was born. Uh, and his regent went out to find him. They went to the sacred vision lake to, to find the new Dalai Lama. And then they went to his home, where they found his mother and father. And they offered the boy the cane of the 13th Dalai Lama. 
And then having recognized the boy, this is the only known mural of the recognition of the 14th Dalai Lama. Um, having found the boy, they put him into his palanquin and they took him to Lhasa, where he was received by the regent and then taken uh, past the Patala into the Norbulinka, into a small room, the Wee of Potrang, created by the seventh Dalai Lama. And in that room, he spent his first year in Lhasa, surrounded by paintings of ritual offerings, a copy of the Lukong murals, and a map of Lhasa. Uh, so he was unable to go out into the city, but he was told stories daily. In the summer, we will come to the Norbulinka, uh, but in the winter, we will live inside the Patala. And there, at this time of year, you will go to the jo This was his guide to Lhasa. And this is painted 100 years before a recent map acquired by, 150 years before a recent map acquired by uh, David. We're going to look at that in just a minute. But I did want to show you these murals. The Dalai Lama was so impressed. When I met the Dalai Lama in the 1990s, and I was interviewing him about the history of Tibet, I said to him, how did you first hear of Guru Rinpoche? How did you first hear of Chen Risi? And he said, I saw them in murals, and monks told me stories. So when he grew up, he, and he made his own Oops. And he made his own murals. Um, he created a history of Tibet, illustrating everything from the beginning of man to his own enthronement. So this is his state enthronement painting, painted in the 1950s by uh, Amdo Tashi. And as you can see at the bottom, there, it includes uh, Buddhist figures from the past. But then these are photorealistic images of real people in Tibet at that time, including this very famous opera singer. Remember our opera? Uh, the Dalai Lama loved opera performances. And you have many different figures from Tibetan society here at that time. And him on his throne um, uh, with his regent beneath him and his cabinet over here. This is probably the last painting of a Dalai Lama in Tibet that will be made uh, if we assume that the current Dalai Lama's going to have a very difficult reentry, um, And so uh, this is a curious painting also in the Dalai Lama's private meditation chapel. And even though it's done in the style of a calendar in India in the early 20th century, <laughs> do you notice the transformation of physiology allowing the eruption of light from the top of the head? So the ideal that was, we see in murals from 1080 that the body itself is transformed by this kundalini energies is being maintained even in this totally modern style. And while they were in India, before the Chinese invasion, the painter, Amdo Tashi, apparently got his hands on a book of Gauguin and liked what he saw. <laughs> so as I say, the Dalai Lama, when he made his paintings, he created this, had this painting made by Amdo Tashi to show the transmission of energy as a rainbow from Chenrisi into the monkey that then evolves into the first human beings. Uh, here are the first human beings losing their tails as they eat the special barley that Chenrisi has prepared for them. Here's the foundation of the Jokong Temple uh, after miraculous appearances. And then finally, after the Dalai Lama has left his homeland and come to Lhasa, the final scene on this wall is the Dalai Lama meeting with Mao Zedong. Um, so this is a 1,000 years of Tibetan murals with many, many, many different narratives. And I'm sorry to have bored you for as long as I have. I know I've run over. Um, but I, I, I wanted you to think at the end about what is being transmitted here. Yes, there is politics. This is a map to many worlds. But the essential map that is being transmitted you is into your own heart. This is a map about mindfulness. And the message has not changed in a 1,000 years.
I'm, there's, there's a short sequence that I would like to do finally. This is a map that David recently acquired, and he was kind enough to share with me. It's in Russian. It was printed around 1850. And that's in the Krillic language, so that's Lhasa up there. Uh, I'm assuming. I was just reading the geography. I, I'm assuming that's Lhasa. And this is a lake that they didn't get very accurately, but uh, still. And, and so in Lhasa, this shows the journey from China to Lhasa, published about 1848. But inside, uh, the, and David, am I wrong in saying this is one of the first maps of the route to Tibet? Yeah, 1828. 1828. And in there, you have these paintings uh, which were rendered in a style that you will remember. So here you have 1720. And oh, sorry. Here you have 1720. And here you have 1820. And you notice the round towers that are over here. You see the two round towers on either side? So that tells us that this is later than 1760 when they were built. Uh, so when this was painted, they were not there. This is one of the, one of the many kinds of things we can gain from maps, uh, is to be able to judge how they're changed when people are accurate with them. So I just wanted to share that with you. I was very entranced to see this map from this Russian book and then to compare it to this. Uh, so it's very clear that the Russians had hired some Tibetan artist to make something for them, and then they created this for their book. Thank you so much for having me. If there's any questions, I'm happy to entertain. It commissions, it could be many years of work, decades of work. Like on the Kumbum, they were working there for 20 years. So no, that there was no centralized body. This was a very diffuse uh, guilds. And they were depending upon the approval of their peers, but there was no formal process. Right here. He asked about the materials. Um, the materials of the painting with the very oldest, well, first of all, all of them are on adobe surfaces that are prepared and treated. It begins, when you're making the wall, you use a, a mud for the mortar that has hair in it from horses and sheep. And then that comes out of the wall. And then you put a final layer onto the wall, which is attaches to that, so that the exterior thick mud that you're going to paint on is actually bound into the central material through the hairs. There's a mixture of hairs and straw and all of that. And then on top of that, you put gesso, and then you do charcoal lines, and then you mix your color pots outside in the sunlight, and then you mark them with a letter, and the master has drawn the tikse on the wall, and the students come in and follow. They paint by number. So and you, all the color mixing is done outside in the sunlight, not uh, inside. So the master does not actually paint. He may not. He may not. It depends. He will do the tikse, he will, and, they, and then the atelier will do the color fields. And then over the color fields, he'll do the final outlines over the body. And then there's people for the gold. It, it's, it's many processes are involved there. But the, the, in the oldest paintings, they're probably using egg or water. Uh, with muds, but by the later paintings, most of the paintings, they're taking rawhide or skin or bone and they're melting it, making a hot liquid, and then whipping the minerals into it. So the surface of the murals is like a nail. The jantas are, you know, what is that, the uh, fourth, fifth, sixth century, you know, uh, and so these are, these are much later. Uh, and I could be wrong. You'll have to Google me on that. Back here. Um, like the Kushan Empire, the Gandharan, the Gandharan, yeah. And some of these were more dominated by Indian, and some of them by Greek. But in some cases, like the Greek king Melinda, he's very famous, and he, yeah, Melinda, he. he and he's very famous. He was, you know, the Greek king. He came from a Greek family. They had direct connections to Greece. He was raised speaking Greek. 
He employed Greek artisans. I mean, these, and these people had direct engagement with Buddhism and were Buddhists. So to think that these Greeks were not in contact with Rome and Greece is absurd. Of course they were transmitting Buddhist teachings back to Rome and Greece during this period. And this is not something people think about, nor do they think about the fact that early Buddhist art was totally dominated by the Indo-Greek influences either. Right, you see that in the Asian art pieces. Exactly. Really Greek yes, the big Greek pieces, yes, they're beautiful. The Lukong. Yes. How old were the paintings in the Lukong? Uh, there's been much debate about that, uh, but based upon the uh, evidence of what we find, since we find a painting of the six Dalai Lama's father with his name on it, we must assume that the paintings in the Lukong were done in the time of the six Dalai Lama or later. Uh, certainly not in the time of the fifth. Now, perhaps there were rooms of murals from the time of the fifth Dalai Lama on the lower floor, but those were mostly destroyed. Only one room survives on the lower floor. I don't know what was in the other parts of that. Hmm. More questions? Yes, Ani. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Annie asks about uh, Annie asks about uh, what again? Uh, what's on the top room? But what was the other question? Did you photograph all the rooms? Okay, did I photograph all the rooms? Uh, so yeah, in the Gansai Kumbum, there are seventy-two chapels on seven floors. It's a huge undertaking to inventory. I did a quick inventory, a dirty, cheap inventory of every single room. But then when I actually captured gigapixel images, I restricted myself to only 40 or 50 murals from the, all of the murals that are there, because it, it's impossible. I mean, I would need much more support than I had to be able to, to attempt to get them all. And then when you go to the very top, the mother and father tantras are just below the top floor, which has a trap door that opens onto the roof, into the ceiling where you're exposed to the air. <laughs> Uh, which very few people get access to. Uh, it, it's, um, you have to have good relations with the monks, and you have to have been coming for a long time, and slowly they will give you more and more access. And you have to be patient. You need to come every day and meet people and have tea with them and, you know, buy lunch. <laughs> Pardon? On the very top, there, I can show you pictures. Uh, there, there's the five... I think it's the five Buddhas at the very top. I think it's the five Buddhas, yeah. yeah. Here? Are you thinking you're going to be able to do more projects like this, like for Ladakh and other areas? Am I going to do more projects? Um, I would like to. The first job I have before me is to secure the future of the existing archive. So it's 25 terabyte of data, and uh, it needs to be organized, and then it needs to be made accessible, preserved, and made accessible for future generations. And then I have to do a commentary project about the stories I've been telling you, by the way. I'm stupid. I don't know this stuff. I was taught this by the Dalai Lama, by Karmapa, by Heather Stoddard, by Jakob Winkler, by Bob Thurman, by um, Mathieu Ricard. By, I mean, I'm just parroting what I've learned. And I happen to be very visually oriented, as you might have seen. And so I'm able to recall things that people have told me over the centuries. Become, over the centuries. <laughs> over the, <laughs> it, seem, it seems that long. <laughs> I happen to be able to recall things that people have told me over the last decade because I can, I can pin it to the, the visual material. But as far as future projects, yes, I hope to be able to do work in India. I would love to go to Ajanta and Ellora. I would love to go to Ladakh. I would love to go to Bhutan and Burma and Thailand. But that requires, first of all, securing the archive that exists. And so there's a lot of institutional building work that I'm engaged in now, uh, talking with patrons and uh, technologists and uh, how to make this accessible to people. We're looking at a number of different ways to do that. And once we achieve that, ideally, it'll, I'll, I'll, I will be 
a part of an existing institution with an endowment that would allow me to train young people to go and do what you want done. Because uh, I'm, I'm 66, so uh, I've only got a few more, maybe one more decade where I can go out in the field. We'll see. Um, and so I, but I would like to be engaged in transmitting this information to future generations, including the techniques for capturing it, which will improve as we go forward. Other questions? Here. Eighth or ninth century. Okay. Do you know of older murals there, or is that? I know of rock paintings that go back prehistoric, you know. So, but those are, have nothing to do with Buddhism. I mean, this is people on horses shooting deers and things like that. Those are the oldest paintings. Back there, in the very back. Oh, no. I, I, I probably misspoke. Um, I, I began work on this in the 90s. Uh, and so I've been, you know, when I tell this story publicly, don't hold me to any specific time structure. But, <laughs> but yes, the, 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 the death of the Taliban Buddha uh, and the failure of the West to do anything about it and the inertia of all existing cultural institutions around the world complete failure of humanity's ability to just go and document those before they're blown up. Uh, to me, that was just, it was the last straw. I couldn't deal with it. And so I took responsibility for the murals of Tibet. I think that deserves a round of applause. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>- mythology yes 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 there is and the commentary project is one of the big things I want to undertake the moment I can make these images online accessible yeah, I want to do moderated commentary so that we can collect commentary from monks, from scholars, from Western historians, and so on. There was one more question here. Sorry, Can it, we're, we're going to get no, short. Yes. Good. You had a question here? I'll give you a card, and that's something we could talk about in, in email. Any more questions? Thank you so much for coming. Uh,
And, uh, Jesse is here. You know, my work isn't done until all 1,000 copies of this book have been sold and transmitted to the future. And you are the only ones who can do that work. The Dalai Lama, if you, if you appreciate what the Dalai Lama and I have done to preserve this work, it's depending upon you to buy this book and to give it to institutions around the world. That's the real way this work will be transmitted to the future. So thank you so much for your support. Thank you for coming out. And I'll be happy to talk to some of you individually with the books. Thank you. Thank you.